Welcome to the ISO Show, dispelling myths and sharing tips for success to improve your business with ISO standards with your host, Mel Blackmore. Many of us take for granted our places of work and also where we shop, where we spend our leisure time. And we don't necessarily realise that there's a whole heap of responsibilities associated with creating these safe, secure and pleasant environments for us to work and to have fun. The facilities market here in the UK and overseas is huge. And until recently, we didn't have any kind of structure or systems for managing our facilities. That's until ISO 41001 came along which is the international standard for facilities management. And I'm delighted to invite Ian Vanderpool to the ISO show today to explain more about the standard. Ian brings a wealth of knowledge on facilities management and in particular ISO 41001. Currently, Ian's the chairman of the European Facilities Standards Committee and he's also the co-author of ISO 41001 plus ISO 41114, which is a standard on FM strategy. Within the ISO FM Standards Committee, he's also chairman of the Strategic Portfolio and head of delegation for the Netherlands. In addition to his involvement with the ISO Technical Committee for the Standard, and championing ISO 41001. And when you hear the interview, you will hear his passion and enthusiasm for the standard and the FM sector. In addition to this, he's got his own business, which is ISO 41001 CSI. He's currently working with the Dutch Ministry of Defence. And here, amongst other things, is responsible for implementing a brand new FM system fully compliant to ISO 41001 which is actually going to serve 60,000 military and civilian personnel across over 50 military facilities. He's also former chairman of the Dutch Facilities Management Association and a former director of IFA May's Global Board of Directors. So I think it goes without saying, he is the font of all knowledge when it comes to FM and also ISO 41001. Hello and welcome, Ian. Thanks very much for joining us today. Thank you. Great. Well, before we begin, Ian, could you share with us something that not many people know about you, please? Well, I would say that that probably would be that I really, really thoroughly enjoy cooking. Good food and good drink is something that opens conversation and it makes life so much easier. So lots of people think about me as somebody who is really into facilities management and the technicalities behind it, but it's all about people. Ah, interesting. Is there any particular type of food that you enjoy cooking? Oh, that's a good one. I love Asian food. Oh, okay. Lovely. Excellent. Well, yeah, definitely uh, always a good opportunity to share, you know, times with people. And I know obviously that's a bit trickier at the moment with COVID-19, but I'm sure that's something that everybody's looking forward to, to getting back and doing with families, friends and local communities. So how did you get involved with ISO 41001? What's your background? Okay, I was heavily involved in facility management within the Dutch Ministry of Defense. And because of that, I, I had to look at a, at a larger network to get the information uh, that I really needed about facilities management. Why do I say that? It's, it's, the Defense is a government uh, organization. And if you want to compare what we do with other organizations that are similar, you have to look abroad. So I was really creating and working on my professional network. I was the chairman of Facilities Management Netherlands. And at a certain moment in time, I was asked to become board member in the global board of directors of the International Facility Management Association. So when I joined the board for the first time, the chairman of the board, Jim Whitaker, the first thing he asked me, and I knew him a little bit longer, he said, where are the Dutch? And I had no idea what he was talking about. So actually I said, well, well, so what do you mean, Jim? And then he told me that he was actually on the ISO TC 267, 
and he was the convener of the working group that was creating a new facilities management standard. And I thought, boring, boring. <laughs> so, but the next time again, he said, where are the Dutch? And then I realized that, you know, of course, back in the days, and he, he also mentioned that, is that we started FM standards in 2001 with the Dutch standard, then 2748. And if you look back at it, it, it was not a great standard, but it was, as far as I can see, it was the first standard in this, how would you say, the first standard about facilities management. And at the moment we created that standard, there was already an interest in Europe where other countries said, well, actually, we could use such a standard. So shouldn't we start a miracle or committee in the SEN and create the European standard? So that happened just closely after that. And the Dutch were heavily involved in creating the EN 5221 series of standards. And those were, well, the last standard was created in 2012. And I guess at that moment, in that moment in time, we just, well, we were not that interested anymore. We had the standard and, well, we just went on with what we were doing. And there was a crisis, of course. But the same thing happened then globally, what we had beforehand. So especially from the United States, but also from China, there was lots of interest in creating a global standard that they could use. So the ISO TC267 was formed and they started working on these international standards. So that was happening in the background. So Jim actually explained me what the, the, his working group was working on. And I had to look at the first documents. And at that moment, I had a, an epiphany and thought, oh my God, what went wrong? Why were we not involved? How comes we didn't know this? And that was actually the moment that I got involved in the ISO TC and the creation of ISO 41001. Okay. So clearly there was a significant international demand for some type of facilities management framework. In your view, you know, why do you think it's important to have a standard, an ISO standard for facilities management? Well, let me first say uh, having an ISO standard for facilities management is not really chic or special because there's many ISO standards that we use in facilities management. And I think most people don't even realize the number of standards we use. And some of them are specific for facility management such as uh, ISO 41011 for cabinetry, and some are less clear perhaps. But ISO 41001 is not just a standard in the ISO series. It's a, a the first management system standard for facilities management. And I think that's where the magic starts. Now, all the other standards are, of course, created to make high quality of repeatable technical tasks possible or create uniform criteria, methods, processes, practices. And they're really zooming into products or services or parts of the organization. But ISO 41001 is the first standard for FM that is focusing on the FM organization itself. And it helps you, as an FM organization, organize for success. So I, I reckon that's where the big difference is. So it helps you mature from a more operational and reactive point of view and, and existence into a more strategic and proactive organization. So it says something about the maturity of our profession. Yeah, it certainly does. And as I said in the intro earlier, we do take it for granted, uh, you know, that the facilities that we work in, that we go and visit, whether it's a, you know, a theater or a gym, we don't necessarily realize, you know, what's involved with the management of those facilities. So obviously with the standard, you mentioned that there is a series of standards, but I just wanted to clarify, is ISO 41001 the only certifiable standards? that organizations can actually be certified against, if that makes sense. Yes, I understand the question. And actually, the whole, I can make a very lengthy answer. And the answer is actually, yes, it's the only standard you can get certified against. So the others in the series, just to clarify for our listeners, the other standards that are associated with it are in support of running facilities management operation, like the vocabulary and things like that. So it helps to kind of define and provide further information on best practice. Is that what you'd say? That's correct. And it actually helps you. It creates a baseline you can use. But again, you can only certify your organization. And again, this is the only standard that is really valid as a requirement standard for your organization. Okay, cool. So I think our listeners will be interested in, you know, how does a standard get created? What's the kind of the background to the creation of that? So you mentioned about China, America, Holland, you know, so clearly there are lots of different countries involved. How does that actually come together, Ian? Could you give us an idea on how can, you know, because obviously these are 
countries that are representing the industry in their countries and they'll have in some cases similar views but in some cases very different views i was just wondering kind of what's the background to pulling a standard like this together okay well there's a number of questions in one sentence <laughs> but if we look at the people and country side, well, first of all, you have to understand that those standard committees or those, those mirror committees, the, the representatives of the countries, they have uh, two roles. One is representing their country, and there the mirror committee comes in, and of course that country will have one vote in the plenary meeting that we have in the TC. But actually the standards are not made by countries, by people representing their country, although some people still think that. The standards are created by international experts from different countries, and they create the standard. And then the standard is put to vote, and of course that's where the countries come into place and their, and their backgrounds. So if you look at the working groups that are creating the standards, you'll find a bunch of very committed FM professionals from different pieces of the world, from different professions. You will find professors, you will find CEOs, you will find uh, consultants, you will find people working for government. It's really many years, uh, only relatively short experience, and they all work together. They all bring in their very specific knowledge and background, and together as a team, and you can believe it or not, because if you ever worked with professionals, you know, <laughs> that can be uh, rather lively, but we work from the, the premise of consensus. So in the end, we all have to find a solution that is workable for all. And that's a beautiful process. And actually, well, I don't see so much of the national input there, unless you're, for instance, uh, talking about words that are not translatable. Uh, the Japanese had a problem with the client organization, which would, be, would make sense for many others. And that's the reason why we actually mentioned the demand organization in the ISO 41001. So we find a solution there amongst experts. And of course, that's the part how the working group works. The other part is that ISO, of course, has the high-level structure, Annex L, and that is also rather prescriptive of how the standard, what the standards should look like, and certain clauses and subclauses, what should be uh, in there. But that's, of course, necessary to make sure that they all fit in this ISO plugin system. Great. So if I had a facilities management company, or if I was responsible for a venue, for a facility, what would you say would be the main drivers for implementing ISO 41001? Okay. Again, there you will find different categories of people for whom ISO 41001 could have different interests. As for instance, if you take the, the owners of such a building, or let's call them the demand organization, they would see different advantages than if you're an in-house FM provider or you're a commercial FM provider that is being hired. If I look at the owners or the demand organization, I can imagine that in the world is changing more rapidly than ever. It is really important to have a trustworthy partner doing facilities management for you that really understands what you're trying to achieve, understands your goals, your vision, your strategy, and is helping you in further developing that specific facility so it's, it stays compliant, compliant to all kinds of demands. For the in house provider, well, most of them, they are part of a larger organization and they do not have their own goals, strategy, plans or policies. And they're often seen as cost centers. That's of course not always the case, but many of them are still seen as cost centers. It offers the in-house provider the opportunity to evolve from cost center to value driver and actually start a different dialogue with the demand organization where you can actually show the, the value that you can bring in for the organization. If you're a commercial provider, well, first of all, implementing the standard and getting certified, if you want to do that, would demonstrate reliability as a very professional provider. And of course, there is commercial value in it because you, you see that a lot, for instance, now in Saudi Arabia, UAE and Asia, and where if you're the first in class or at least the first of the, the companies that get certified, you will be seen as a thought leader. You will get better access to uh, better contracts so there's actually a lot of uh, a lot of value in it so depending on your perspective it all comes together interesting so i'd just like to pick up on the point that you made about the commercial value so if for example obviously we're based here in the uk 
if there aren't that many organisations in the FM sector that are actually certified to 41,001 yet, then this could potentially give them a USP, a unique selling point, couldn't it, to kind of differentiate themselves in the marketplace? Because I know that it's pretty much a prerequisite, you know, it's a pretty much a passport to tender that you have to have certain ISO standards, typically ISO 9001, 14 and 45. And actually, we'll, we can come on to that question in a bit and how, you know, a company might take those into consideration. But it is what it says on the can, isn't it? It's a facilities management standard framework, so why not go for it? But I would say that there's two ways of the commercial value. The, the driver, of course, would be if in tenders, uh, the demand organization would require that the companies that are uh, responding to the tender, that they are ISO 41001 certified. That, of course, would really make the growth go quickly. The drawback of that is that some companies would to say, well, we want to get certified. We're not really interested in what the standard does, but otherwise we cannot respond to any tenders. I think that the real commercial value is for those organizations that understand and realize that implementing this standard in a proper way would actually evolve the quality of your organization and has a big impact on what you do. So the commercial value would also result in, in a reduction of costs within your own organization, a reduction of waste and others but also in the ability of creating a better proposal for your demand organization. So it's actually, it, it works on both sides. The question is, when will FM providers and demand organization in Europe, in the UK, in the, the US wake up? And because it's still lagging behind to the, the countries that we would say are a little less, more, less mature in FM than we are. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about getting the badges, it is about having that robust facilities management system in place to derive the commercial benefits but yeah it's interesting you know you say about you know when will they wake up i think sometimes it takes you know for one of the larger fm organizations for example to actually go for the standard for then others to follow i mean i've seen that based on my experience in other sectors and in other standards like in the events industry for example they wouldn't have necessarily considered 14,000 on the environmental standard but as soon as as of 2012 one the sustainable event management standard was launched at the olympics there was a huge surge of interest from the events industry that they wanted to kind of, you know, to get that much, but also have systems in place so that they could run sustainable events. Because for the first time, there was a framework for that. So it, it seems logical to me that, you know, having that framework, whether you go for certification or not, that's not necessarily the point here, but just using that framework, because at the end of the day, it's, you know, best practice from across the globe, isn't it? basically coming together to say, yeah, this is a great framework. Why, why not use it? And the risk of not doing that is that the moment that the demand organization to wake up, you have got a lot of work to do. And, and you, know, you better be prepared. And another good thing is, of course, uh, because of the risk-based approach that you will find in ISO standards in general, but 41,001 in particular. I did some research in the, in the companies that got certified worldwide. And of course, with the COVID-19 situation that, that we currently enjoy, uh, one of the questions I had there, did implementing ISO 41,001 help you prepare for well, what happened not so long ago? And the interesting part is, depending on the area, for instance, in, in Singapore, they had MERS and SARS beforehand, and they really had a good system in place. Uh, they didn't expect this, but they had a good system in place of preparing that. But in other countries also, COVID-19 just happened to them, but because they really managed to organize for success and for managing risk in a proper way, they were able to manage the situation much better. And, and create a working environment that was uh, suitable to the, the situation much faster than many other uh, organizations. So it also helps you cope with unexpected events. Sure, because I think there's still, I think it's fair to say, in a lot of uncertainty about people going back into the workplace right now. You know, there, there are doubts. I mean, we're recording this at the moment in, in our office and the rest of the time I'm home working, but we come back to base to, you know, to do our podcasting. But there was kind of this kind of seed of doubt in my mind, you know, before coming into the office is, you know, what about the air conditioning? So, you know, other people in the building, is it safe? You know, will there be hand sanitization points? And unfortunately, you know, we have got a good FM company that looks after the building. But I think there will be a lot of questions raised about, say, cleanliness, the health and hygiene associated with facilities over the next, not just few months, but the coming years. Because I think this has been quite an important lesson learned over the last few months, you know, would you say that has had an impact on the FM industry? But if you look at that approach, 
becomes even more interesting because, of course, that would be a reactive approach for which you could prepare, which is really important. And you have to make sure the HVAC uh, is in order and the hygiene is in order. But if what you see now, is, at least in the Netherlands, if we're talking about working from home and everything related to that, that should have been a topic for FM. And quite often, it's actually HR that is uh, taking the lead there which is also a sign that the FM organizations are not thinking in a proper strategic manner yet because the intent what we have is making sure that in the core business, in the demand organization, productivity is, is safe and is actually in, improved. So instead of only fake focusing on the building, we should actually focus much broader than that and see, well, okay, something is happening. People start, will start working from home. How can we organize that? Mm -hmm. So I think oh, we missed that one. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think what would be interesting now then, Ian, is if we could dive into the standard itself and, you know, what would you say in your experience are some of the benefits of having a facilities management system in place that's been aligned with the standard? One of the advantages would be, and again, I'm also working in a government institution, and we all know that there's a damming cycle plan to check act which is actually a cycle, so it should be continuous. But quite often, and I see it in many businesses, uh, we tend to focus on operations. And if something goes wrong in operations, we change something and we go on. And there's actually not really a cycle in which we learn. Uh, so we tend to focus on details instead on the system itself. So this standard will actually help you in that one. The second part that I, well, actually the main difference that would be most relevant for me about how why is ISO 41001 creating a big difference is that the FM organization is is forced to think about why do I exist in the first place and why I, am I organized and what should we actually do and so you have to look outside instead of inside and you have to get in touch with your demand organization and figure out what they are trying to achieve but because our task as FMs would be to make sure that we are able to support the core business. And so you have to understand the core business. That's the first one. Yeah, and of course, and the second one is that to be able to do so, you need to ask different questions. So you really have to raise to the occasion and, and start a more strategic dialogue with the organization you work for. That's a lot, lot of info in one sentence, I guess. But I would say that's the main thing. Okay, great. Thanks for that. And so we mentioned earlier about some of the other standards that facilities management companies often have, such as the quality standard 9001, environment standard 14001, and more often than not, they also have the health and safety standard ISO 45001. So if you've got all of those badges, you know, you've got that QHSC system in place, why would you need ISO 41001 in addition to that? Or would you have it instead of it to replace it? Well, what's your view on that, Ian? Okay. Well, let's first say that I was uh, struggling with this question for a long time, uh, even when I was giving my training course. And in one of the training courses last year, I had the managing director of a facilities management organization actually had the same question. And I think about two hours, three hours in my course, he said, Ian, stop, stop. I now understand it, why we need this. Because it's, it's really clear now, because I really want to work together, I want to get in touch, I want to have a proper dialogue with the demand organization and figure out how we can maintain and, and further develop this, uh, this facility so that it's fit for use also in five years. And, and actually, I, he says, I'm using 9001 and it's just focusing on consistently providing products and services that meet customer requirements. And the customer requirements are the requirements you had last year or the year before, but the world is changing. And if I want to talk about what's going to happen next year or in five years, ISO 9001 is not going to help me. It's, it's forcing me to focus inward. And of course, ISO 40001, again, because you are a separate entity from the demand organization, you have to create your vision, your strategy, policy, and plans. But those have to be aligned with the demand organization. And your mission is focused on the success of the demand organization instead of the quality of the processes as in 9001. So the difference is that ISO 41001, unless all the others, has a very outward focus. And our mission is to demonstrate effective and efficient delivery of FM that supports the objectives of the demand organization. So that's 
quite a different league. And all the other standards are really relevant. I think 9001 is a brilliant standard if you want to create this, this consistency within your organization. So you can choose to do both of them. The organization I was just talking about, they said, well, because maintaining it will cost money also. So we are going to stop with 9001 and we're going to revert to 41001. But as for the other standards we were talking about, well, those are all, of course, specific standards that fit in the, the, the high level structure, but they are in no way a replacement for 9001 or ISO 41001 because they tend to look at the larger organization and not just parts of it. So yeah, I hope this is more or less an answer to your question. So 41001 is outward looking, focus on the success of the demand organization, thus forcing you to become a force uh, multiplier while ISO 9001 is uh, well. It's completely inward focused. Yes, from that then, you could say that the demand organization, so the client, is getting a lot more value from that relationship because the standard actually has specific clauses, doesn't it, about the contractual relationship and needs and expectations of that relationship. And so say, for example, service level agreements, how is that monitored, measured, reported on? So they're crystal clear in 41,001, whereas you wouldn't have that level of detail in 914 and 45 for the client, would you? The emphasis for 41,001 is very much about the client. So in theory, in the future, it should be the demand organization, the client, that really should be pushing this down their supply chain because they're the ones that are significantly going to benefit from it. If they are willing and able to uh, fulfill their own role, because it also means that the client, the demand organization, really has to get into that role. So they're not involved in the process of facility management. They have their own core business and they have to share that information with the facilities managers so that we can actually create something together. Actually, as it says, that it actually mentioned it in the document itself, where we say that the, the FM organization and the, the demand organization, they really need to work together to clearly define the needs to meet the core business strategy and to develop FM policies and practices that will enable the core business activities of the demand organization. So you can't do it all by yourself. If there's no commitment from the demand organization, it's going to be a very bumpy ride, I guess. Mm -hmm. Okay. So obviously you've had a lot of experience with the standard uh, over the last couple of years. And I know that you're actively working with an organization where they've got you know 60,000 employees plus 50 or so military facilities as well. So could you share with our ISO show listeners some tips for implementing the facilities management system? I mean, where do they begin and, and how do they comply with the standard? Okay, well, there are some tips, but it all depends on the organization you work for. That is the, the complexity of the demand organization, but the same thing the complexity of your FM organization. So the first question you should always ask, why are we doing this? If that's not clear, if, if it's also not clear why you should be implementing it, you, if you can't answer that, you're starting on the wrong foot. So it does help to understand uh, beforehand how you're going to help the demand organization reach those goals and how, how you want to do that. If you're working in a smaller organization, this could be very easy because, again, uh, you can have a chat with the managing director and uh, figure out what you want to achieve and how you're going to do that. And you'll have your management buy-in. If you're working for organizations such as mine, in government where we have multi-layered organization with politics involved and in this case where uh, all shared services are brought together into one branch of the military then you'll have to find another way because often you have to uh, work with people who do not really understand facility management or at least they have a, a view of facility management that might not be completely from the 21st century you have to go around that and in our case we focused on who are we actually working for? And that those would be the people on the different military installations or facilities that have very specific tasks, and they are all different. If there's an infantry unit, they do different work than a, a fighter squadron or a naval squadron or if a, a training school. So you really have to understand the context of the organization you're working for. And the more abstract you make it, so if you go higher up the hierarchy, the context becomes more political. But if you go down to earth, to your factory, to your office building, then you realize that the, the organizations working there have very specific tasks at hand. If you, don't, if you understand that, it's very easy to implement 
something that works that people in your FM organization understand and that works for that specific location. And if you have 40 locations or 50 locations such as we have, then the only thing you have to do is copy that, uh, that process over all those different locations. Again, the context will be different everywhere. There will be other stakeholders involved. But then you only have to create a system that will make it possible to work on all those locations according to the system. So complexity, you have to understand the smaller it is. In the end, it, it is create this vision, what you want to do, create a, by the standard, create a project. And if you don't completely understand it, get some consultants in that really understand the standard because there will be many st consultants these, uh, that will say, I can help you implement a standard. But one of the lessons learned in all the organizations that I interviewed was you really need to understand how FM works because otherwise you're just filling in the requirements, but it will not work. Cool. So some great tips from you there then. Fantastic, Ian. Now, what would be great is if we could, uh, just to kind of wrap this up, how can our audio social listeners find out a bit more about you and get in touch? And, and the other thing I'd like to touch on as well is on a training course that I, I want to mention to our audio social listeners as well. So how can they get in touch with you? Well, the easiest way is just visit my website, which would be www.iso41001csi.com. And you will find my contact details there. And of course, uh, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. You will find me, if you search for Ian Vanderpool, you will find me on LinkedIn and you can ask questions there too. And of course, what I created in the past, because, well, the question I got from Jim Whitaker, where are the Dutch? I could say now, where are the FMs? Because lots of FMs don't really understand about ISO 41001 or they don't even know about it yet. So I created a foundation training course, which answers three questions, the why, what, and how. And the first one would be, why should, uh, should one start with ISO 41001 in the first place? That question is answered. And what is the added value for the participant, uh, the FM professional or the FM organization? And how can you actually successfully sell the standard within your organization to start the process of implementation? Because you will need the, the management buy-in, you will need funds. So all these questions are being answered in the, uh, in the ISO 41001 Foundation Training Course, which is a one-day course with lots of interactive exercises and dialogue among the participants. And it's a jolly show. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, great, because I think when I heard about this originally, Ian, I was really keen. I mean, that's kind of one of the things that inspired me to get you onto the ISO show so that we can share that with, with our ISO show listeners as well. So basically what we're going to be doing then is we're going to actually be hosting one of these facilities management foundation courses, aren't we? And I love the simplicity of the why, what, and how that you explained. And I know that these generally retail at over 5,000 euros, if that's going to be in-house, but obviously as a result of COVID and also because we've got international listeners as well, we're going to be offering a heavily discounted rate, aren't we, for this particular course. So further details of that is going to be available on our website and the links to all of Ian's contact details are available. But basically, if you drop us an email with reference to the ISO show, you'll be able to get that heavily discounted. And I'm really delighted that we're able to offer this at just 500 euros for that interactive one day workshop, which will be, there'll be lots of exercises and takeaways that you can take back into your business and apply them. And then you can really evaluate, you know, whether this foundation course is going to help you to implement ISO 41001, or whether it's just to kind of take away some of that best practice and all that knowledge and experience that Ian can share with you. So thanks very much for that, Ian. That's really generous of you. And again, that's going to be on the 18th of September, and that will all be delivered online. And information on that will be available on our website and obviously on Ian's website. It's, it's going to be mirrored. Okay. So is there anything else that you'd like to add before we go then, Ian? Well, if you're thinking about implementing the standard, but you're still wondering about what should I do or, well, don't hesitate. The best way to start this is actually take the first step. So go for it, join the training, follow the website and the articles also from the ISO TC. You already mentioned ISO 41014. That's how to create a valid FM strategy. There's lots of tools available to help you become this value driver. You're probably always inspired to be. 
Fantastic. Well, talking about inspiration, you've really been an inspirational guest on our show today, and I'm absolutely delighted that you spent the time to share all of that experience and knowledge and hints and tips with our ISO show listeners today. So thanks once again, Ian. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Looking to use ISO standards to drive better business practice? Contact us at blackmoresuk.com to access further information and book your free 15-minute call.